OM Ships International is a non-denominational Christian organization dedicated to bringing knowledge, help, and hope to the people of the world. Since 1970, our vessels have welcomed more than 45 million visitors up the gangways in over 150 different countries and territories. For many, a visit to one of our ships is the first time they've ever had access to good quality literature at a price that they can afford. And this attraction often brings thousands of visitors to the ship each day. Our current ship, Logos Hope, features the world's largest floating book fair. And with over 5,000 titles of Christian, educational, and children's books, there's something for the whole family. Many people without access to education have learned vital skills and have been able to enhance their lives through a purchase from the onboard book fair. While in port, the crew also come alongside the people of the country in practical ways, providing water purifiers, eyeglasses, library projects, and more in an effort to share the love of God in a tangible way. God has used books from the OM Ships Ministry and the practical service of Logos Hope's crew to impact countless lives for His glory. Good evening and welcome to Port Adelaide Baptist Church's Missionary Convention. The convention this year definitely doesn't look how we expected it to, and it's hard to believe that after five months we're still online, but we're thankful to God for his provision and for the resources we have that we can still meet together, even if it is virtually. We know that God is faithful and we know that he is bigger than COVID-19 and we want to pray that he blesses the efforts of those involved to help bring the Missionary Convention to our homes. Another thanks to Gordon Stewart for what he shared with us from Asia Link this morning. If you missed it, you can watch it on Put It On Baptist Church YouTube channel at any time. Tonight we have Kira McClellan sharing with us about her time aboard Logos Hope with Operation Mobilization. And we have the live wire band along to lead us in our praise. We're grateful for our speakers who have kindly agreed to take part in this year's convention online. Throughout the week, we will hear from Colin Murray from Faith and Actions Missions, Ronnie McCracken from Eskil Trust, John Burney from Slavic Gospel Association, Boyd George from the Irish Evangelistic Band, Philip Moore from Acts 29, and Andrew Elliott will bring an update from Baptist Missions. It would be great if you could tune in to as many as you are able. I'm going to pray just before the library band lead us in our praise. Our Father, we praise you as a God bigger than COVID-19 or anything else. We know that you are able to overcome these circumstances and bring good from them. Thank you for the opportunity we have to hold the convention this year and for all the gifts you've blessed those involved with. We pray for Kira just now, as well as the other speakers through the week, that you'll use the words they've recorded to speak to those listening. Remove any distractions in our home and soften our hearts to the word of the gospel and your mission. We pray for those listening in their homes who are lonely, Father, those who have lost loved ones or are sick. We pray that you would draw near to them, be their refuge and help in times of trouble. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. strength within the sorrow there is beauty in our tears and you meet us in our morning 
with the love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Your wisdom unimagined Who could understand your ways Reigning high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lowly Passionate and kind You surround and you uphold me Your promises are my delight Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood Faithful forever Perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. Even when the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good, you're working for our good, and for your glory. Even when the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good, you turn it for our good, and for your glory. Even in the valley you are faithful, you're working for our good. You're working for our good What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that me white as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus.
evening, Pour Down Baptist. It is so good to be able to speak to you here this evening. I very much wish it was in person and that I was staring out at all of your faces and not into a camera, but alas, this is as good as it currently gets. For those of you who have no idea who's on your screen right now, my name is Kira. I've been going to Pour Down Baptist now for about six years, which seems absolutely crazy. But for the last two of those years, I have been serving in missions overseas. Quite literally, in this case, overseas, as I was on a ship called the Logos Hope. And that's why I'm here speaking to you this evening as part of our Missionary Convention Week at PBC. Before I continue, I would just love to say a big thank you to the church for supporting me for the past two years. I literally could not have done it without your support and most importantly your prayers. It meant so much to know that there was a church family behind me every step of the way whilst I was out there. Although I have been on the ship for nearly two years, I am still no good at actually explaining the ship. This is what it looks like and for me it really was just a place of family, friendship and serving all rolled into one. The ship is also part of a larger organisation called Operation Mobilisation and OM has a mission statement which says we want to see vibrant communities of Jesus followers amongst the least reached. Vibrant communities of Jesus followers amongst the least reached. For me, before I went to the ship, I had no idea who the least reached were. That phrase I don't know if I could even have given you a definition of it, but for the past two years, that sentence has greatly shaped my life and what I've been doing each and every day. And tonight, I would love to focus on those final two words with you, the least reached. For many of you watching this, you maybe know a lot more than I do. You can list facts and figures that I haven't even heard of before. But maybe for some of you, the least reached is just as unknown as it once was to me. So, who are the least reached? The least reached peoples are those who have no access to the gospel. This may mean that they have no Bible in their language. They don't have a viable Christian witness, a church anywhere nearby. Whenever they go into their workplace, there's likely no Christian there. Whenever a child walks into their school, there's no Christian teaching and no witness to them of Jesus's love. If you ask someone who is least reached, who is Jesus? They're more likely to say to you, ah, that's my neighbor who lives down the street than answer with my savior. This is the reality for so many around the world. So many being 3.1 billion people. I don't know if you know the current world population, but it is close to 8 billion people. So 3.1 billion of those, nearly 40%, are classified as least reached. These people are lost without the hope of Jesus. They're so lost, they don't even have a map back to the road. Instead, we are privileged with that map right here in our hands. We have the gospel. We have the good news that we are saved from our sins right here. God cares so much about the lost, these least reached people of the world. And we as his church should care too. He has compassion for them and we as his church should have compassion for them too. Now I don't want you to just take my word for it but instead let's turn together to Luke 15 and see what God has to say about the lost. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. 
And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and reckless living. And then, of course, we all know the end of that parable where the son realises whilst eating food meant for pigs that he is so much better off with his father, returns to him and the father embraces him with open arms. In the closure of that parable then, verse 32, It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Here we can see God's heart for the lost, not once, not twice, but three times over. Jesus wanted to highlight this message so much he said it three times. And this is a message that we have all heard so many times. These parables are not new to us. I'm sure many of you have heard them from Sunday school hundreds of times over. But whenever we look at these parables, it's important not to look at them just individually without looking at the context to which they were written. Let's read again verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And then the start of verse 3 says, So he told them this parable. Whenever the tax collectors and the sinners, the lost of this time, were coming close to Jesus, the Pharisees grumbled. They were not showing the compassion that Jesus wanted them to have for the lost. And it is into this situation that Jesus tells these three stories. It is so easy to read these stories and to simply understand that God came to save sinners, how he will leave the flock to find the one, how the lady will seek diligently for the coin, or how the son is welcomed back with open arms. But all of these alone are not the reason that Jesus was telling these parables. Yes, it is so important to know that God came to save sinners. But that is not all that Jesus wants us to understand here. He wants us to see that we too should have compassion for the lost. Just like he was teaching the Pharisees at the time. We too should have compassion for the lost. So don't just skip over these vital two verses and look at what God has done for the lost, forgetting that we have a part to play in that as well. He was speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes at this time, the religious leaders who intimately knew the scriptures would have known what God has done in the past for his people, would have known the story of the Israelites, how the Lord split the seas for them, But even though they knew all this, they needed reminded that God has compassion for the lost. They needed reminded that they too should have that compassion. And I firmly believe that the church today needs reminded of that as well. And just like we talked about at the start, there are none more lost than the least reached. Those who have no access to the gospel and no hope in the name of Jesus. These 3.1 billion people around the world with no viable Christian witness. Not only do we not often have compassion for these people, 
Many of us don't even recognise that they exist and are doing nothing in our lives to see that story changed. Now, compassion doesn't come naturally to any of us, I'm sure, certainly not to me. But one of the things I loved most about the ship was seeing how God uses us to share his truth despite our lack of compassion. There was one night where this was really highlighted to me. Me and a group of friends who I was working with at the time in the cafe on board went out for dinner in a wonderful little country called Uruguay. We went out for some classic asado, which is a local dish there, which is basically meat on top of some more meat. And that was not the highlight of this night in itself, despite how delicious it was. But instead, why I remember this night so fondly was one of the girls I was working with noticed outside of the restaurant two homeless men and she went out and asked them to come and eat with us. One of them came and joined us and as he ate he shared some of his heartbreaking story. This man was so obviously in need of the Lord and whilst he was talking we were able to share with him our faith and in the end we were all able to share some Bible verses that meant something to us, encourage him and ultimately pray with him that he would too come to know the Lord. This was a wonderful night, not of course because of this shadow, but because this man was able to be lost and now found. And the compassion that Ishan showed to these men was extraordinary. I myself was much more focused on the fellowship and, and the friendship that we had together and the excitement of going out to, to share a meal and was not showing compassion to these two men. But she knew that that is what God requires of us. In that situation alone, I would not have had the compassion for the loss that she shown. But this night was such an important reminder to me to have compassion at all times and seek ways to show this as often as you can. Whenever we find it hard to show compassion, just like the grumbling Pharisees, God wants to show us his heart for the lost, just like in these three parables. In these parables, I see two threads throughout them that stand out. The first of these is the worth of the item that is lost the worth of the item that is lost. Now we all know that feeling when you just can't find something of yours, whether it be your phone, your car keys, or something precious to you. But why does it feel like that whenever you lose something? Well, it's simple. These things are all worth something to us. They may be useful, they may hold memories, it may be precious to you. Now I misplace things every single day and I think I must get it from my dad because he will go as far as to put his car keys in the fridge to make sure he can find them in the morning and yet somehow still forget where he has put them. But as precious as any of these things may be to us, they have nothing on how much we are worth to God. He made us, he created us in his image and he wants each of us to be in relationship with him. Let's have a look at this in the parables that we read. In the first parable of the lost sheep, we read in verse four, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. This shows us that the shepherd will search until he finds it. He will not give up because the lamb that is lost is worth something to him. He will seek until he has found it. And we see again the worth of the thing that is lost in the parable of the woman searching for the coin. Verse 8 tells us that she will seek 
diligently until she finds it. That word diligently shows that it is not always easy to find something that is lost. It is going to take hard work and time. But the coin was worth something to her. The coin in this passage would have been worth about a day's wages. And so she is going to seek diligently until she finds it. Whenever we partner with God to seek diligently for those who are lost in this world, it is not an easy task. It is an immense task to see these 3.1 billion people come to know Christ, to know that he has the saving power for their lives. But with diligent hard work, it is possible. The final parable also shows the worth of the item or the thing, or in this case, the son that is lost. We read, whenever the son arrives home in verses 22 to 23, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hands and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. The father honours the son with these items, a robe, shoes, ring and fattened calf and each of these show the son's worth to the father. The shoes in particular show that even though the son was going to return and be a servant for the father, that the father said, no, you are my son, you're worthy of being my son. And the shoes show that position in his household was not one of a servant. And just as he was bestowing his worth, God bestows our worth as well. If the lost are worth so much to God, Surely we too should show compassion on them. The 3.1 billion people who do not know the name of Jesus need us to share it with them. They are worth it. The second key thread that I see throughout each of these parables is the rejoicing that comes when the lost is found. This reminds me of another highlight from the ship where we would all gather together at the end of each port and have a meeting called Port Praise. This is a time where we would be able to share stories and encouragement from our time in that place. And this was so important because for each of us during the time we were actually there, it is so easy to get bogged down in your own little task, in your own world and not see the bigger picture of what God was doing in that place. For me, especially during my second year on board, I was in the events department. And although I absolutely loved this, it was so easy for me just to get stressed in each of the little details to be running around the ship frantically and often forgetting the bigger reason I was doing it. But whenever we gathered together and rejoiced in what God has done, it was an absolutely amazing opportunity to glorify him for all that had happened there. And at the end of each of these parables, I imagine exactly that, a little mini port praise. Because whenever we look at the lost sheep in verse six, we can see that he gathered together all his friends and neighbors and said, rejoice with me. And exactly the same in the parable of the lost coin in verse 9, she gathered together all her friends and neighbours and said that exact same thing, rejoice with me. And then the peak of it all in the parable of the prodigal son in verse 23, where it says, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate the son's return. Now, why is it so important that we rejoice? I think it's because rejoicing comes hand in hand with showing compassion. Compassion which mirrors how we should react to the lost of this world, the 3.1 billion people who don't know Jesus. We will not be able to rejoice with them in heaven unless today we show compassion for them. Look again at verse 20. Whenever the son is returning, it says the father, he arose and came. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion 
and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The compassion the father shows is quickly followed by rejoicing. And the Latin root for that word compassion comes from pati, which means to suffer. And the prefect calm means with. So compassion literally means to suffer with. And the connection of suffering with another person brings compassion. And then when that suffering is taken away, it is means to rejoice right alongside those who were once suffering. And whenever we look at this in our world today, we could imagine the joy that comes whenever those who are so lost come to Christ. There's no greater joy than that. There's no greater freedom than the freedom we have in Christ. Think back to the joy you first felt whenever you came to know Christ and how you couldn't help but rejoice. The context of these three parables show us that Jesus wanted the Pharisees to have compassion for the lost. They show us so importantly the worth of the thing, the person, the item that is lost. And they show us the joy that comes when the lost is found. And we, the church today, need this message just as much as the Pharisees did with Jesus. Luke 15 is so clear in what Jesus wants to say. And he says it not once, not twice, but three times over that we are to have compassion for the lost just as he was showing. My biggest takeaway from my time on the ship is exactly that, that God wants his church to actively be involved and have compassion for the lost. This isn't just the calling of a few, but what he requires of his church, of all who profess themselves as Christian and seek to follow him. We aren't to grumble like the Pharisees did, at maybe how much it costs, how much time or effort, or how we are much better off in the comfort of our own homes. Another big takeaway for me though from my time on the ship is that God uses each of us in a different way. He has created us to be his child in his image and he has created us all differently. I don't believe that God is requiring of me to continue to do missions as I have for the past two years in that same format. I don't think I could live on a ship for another two years unless God really shows me that's what he wants for me. It went against all that he created me to be to ask for support from others to do that. It went in some very weird ways, in some of the ministries I did, it wasn't what I felt natural or comfortable doing. But I do know that God wanted me to learn some vital lessons and that's why he had me there for those two years. But there's so many other ways that we can serve, that we can have compassion for the lost. And I believe that just as many ways that God has for me to someday serve he has a way for you to serve too. Wikipedia describes compassion as this. It is what motivates people to go out of their way to help the physical, mental or emotional pains of others and themselves. And I would add into that list the spiritual pains of others as well. We know how important it is that we have compassion for the lost. But how can we go out of our way just as this definition describes to show it? OM and many organisations that serve in missions boil it down to three main ways. And OM in particular says, pray, give and go. This is the message that I shared in many churches around South America and I'm very happy to be able to share that with you tonight as well. The first, of course, is prayer. One of the most powerful tools that we have is prayer. 
Prayer is literally just communicating with God and unlocking his power in your life and also the lives of others who have never heard. Right here, sitting in your home in Portadown, you can be praying for someone the whole way across the world. And it's so important that we don't underestimate the power of prayer. Because without it, we are not going to see the 3.1 billion who don't know the name of Jesus come to know him. It was so evident throughout my time on the ship that it is only with prayer that moves. We quite often said the ship, the fuel of the ship is not actual fuel, but prayer. The second is giving. One of the really interesting things I learned during my time on the ship is that the 21st century church has the resources to fulfill the Great Commission. Some people calculated and they suggested that the church just isn't effectively using its resources in the ways that it was commanded. Less than 1%, 1% goes towards the least reached. How is that possible when Jesus' final commands to us were go and make disciples of all nations? How is it possible whenever we can read so clearly throughout the Gospels and even the Old Testament that Jesus wants to see all nations come to know him? And this isn't just financial resources. This is our time, our gifts, our skills, our energy. All of those things can be given in your compassion for the lost. And finally, of course, that third one, we need people to go. We physically need people to populate these places around the world where Jesus' name has never been heard. It doesn't, of course, mean that you need to do this as a full-time missionary. There are so many ways that it's possible to go and live in these countries and serve and share your faith. I hope that someday God will lead me to be able to do that. I'm going in September to study law and I would love to use that in some form to be able to help the least reached of the world. No matter what skills God has given you, you can be one to go or encourage others, mobilize others with this message to share and have compassion for the lost. All it takes is one little step of obedience. Luke 15, what a mighty chapter, and there's so much we can do in light of it. But just before we close this evening, I really want you to ask yourself, your own heart, do you have compassion for the lost? In what ways does your life show that compassion for the 3.1 billion people who don't have access to the gospel. I hope and pray that this has encouraged you to maybe take up and pray for a least reached group of the world or or give to an organisation that is actively seeking to see them know the name of Jesus. And before we leave this evening, I would love to pray for these as well. God, we thank you that you are a good father, that you love us, that you seek us so diligently. And God, we pray for all those around the world who do not know your name, who do not have the comfort of knowing you. And God, I pray that we as a church would be able to have compassion for these people, Lord, that just as the shepherd did and the lady did, as the father in these parables all seek so diligently, Lord, all showed compassion that we too would. God, I pray that if hearts want to know more or to seek this, God, that you would give them a way. Show them how you want them to serve the lost. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of.
of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto Kindness he lavished on us 
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. to Kira and the Livewire Band for sharing with us this evening. Please join us again tomorrow night at 7.45 as we hear from Colin Murray and Ronnie McCracken. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us tonight. We thank you that no matter where we listen to this convention, we know that you're there. We thank you for Kira, Lord, and for what she shared with us about her time on board the Logos Hope. Thank you for protecting her and helping her as she served you. Thank you that you're working all over the world and that every day people's lives are being changed by the power of the gospel. We pray for the rest of the convention this week, that the videos and technology will run smoothly, that many from Portadown Baptist and further afield will listen in, but most of all, that your name will be glorified for it is worthy of our praise. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.